ladies and gentlemen, the first ever reading by the Zoom players of Unbalanced Force. Unbalanced Force, a play in two acts by Nick Napo. Characters, George Marone, high school physics teacher, late 30s. Chris Marone, his wife, mid 30s. Steve Schmidt, his department chair, early 50s. Sean Meltzer, assistant and superintendent of human resources, mid 30s. Tyler, Billy, Liz, Creter, Dylan, Muller, Brittany, Connor, kids between 16 to 18. Ensemble, four to six kids. Setting, high school, Marone's classroom and the immediate vicinity. Also a 7-Eleven and other random spots in town. Time, Monday with various flashbacks. Scene, rising, a high school science classroom. Darkness, save for the dawn creeping in through the windows. The room is quiet for a few moments before a key is heard in turning in the doorknob. There is a struggle to get the door open with audible grunts happening from the outside. Suddenly the door swings open and a guy singing the cranberries appears in silhouette. With their tanks and their bombs and their bombs and their guns in your head, in your head, they are crying. In your head, in your head, zombie, 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 hey, hey. He turns on the light while his, he skids a door stop under the door with his foot and shoves it into place. The classroom comes alive. There's a random science and, mov and movie posters, class projects, pictures, memorabilia covering every inch of the wall. It's as if everything that crossed this guy's mind since September of 2005 is on the wall. All the desks and chairs have been moved to both sides of the room in front of the counters. There's a door upstage left which leads to his office. The man turns around. George Marone is now gracing us with his presence. He looks like he's been through some shift. Some shit. Otherwise, he's got a little boy face and the body of a dude on the Abercrombie bag if the dude on the Abercrombie bag were a few inches shorter with a dad bod, the disposition of a teenage punk, and the swagger of the Fonz. This is the last place he wants to be right now. He pulls out his phone. Hey Siri, what's the process for firing a tender teacher? He sees the results. Yeah, I don't have time for that. He dials. He waits a minute. Hey, Call me. He puts his phone away, notices the picture frame on his desk. After a beat, he walks over and puts the frame face down. He moves into the back office to drop his bag off and hang up his coat. Scene. Pseudocom. Marone comes back and notices the audience. Are you guys here to help me keep my job? <laughs> oh my god. This is insane. I'm running on two hours of sleep, and I walk in here, and people I don't even know are in here already. Oh my god. What the actual... How did you get in here? Did Joanne clear you at the front? Do you know who she is? She has that mole that takes up like three quarters of her face. No, literally, it does. Like... Uh, sorry, I go wrong. Uh, shit. Uh, shit. Sorry, sorry. Um, down page number. Uh, there he does. Like, I'm surprised she could even see straight. She, she's like the elephant man, except with a mole instead of a tumor. Oh my god. The last 24 hours have been just 50 shades of fucked up, and I am so over it. I've had PCP trips that have made more sense than the past 24 hours. But you know what? It's cool. I'll just take a deep breath and go with it like the adult that I am. But since you're here, can you help me keep my job? I I'm meeting with the Board of Ed later this afternoon, but first I'm seeing Meltzer, the assistant superintendent. I know you don't even know me, but um, I'm Marone. George Marone. Just call me Marone. I teach physics here. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is at the underscore Marone. I use it to post videos of demos, lessons, other things that make my life a hot mess. Enter Steve Schmidt in his signature cowboy hat. He's a fairly big, burly dude. He closes the door behind him. 
There he is, ladies and gentlemen, Toolbag Supreme. No, hold your applause. No, really, hold it. This is Schmidt, Steve Schmidt, Science Department Chair, and my work wife. Sup, Schmidt? What happened Thursday night? You saw it, didn't you? No, you still have it? Uh, let me see. No, of course I don't still have it. Don't you think I'm, do you think I'm that stupid? Do not answer that. No, I got rid of it when they called me out. Is it still on your profile? No, it was a story. What do you mean it was a story? An Instagram story. It, so it's only up for a little while, and then it's gone unless someone archives it. Uh, yeah, you're talking to the least social media savvy, savvy guy in, the, in this building. So it's gone unless someone archives it. That's probably what happened. So what happened on Thursday? Let's see. A little yingling. The Killians, then a couple mm -hmm. shots of tequila, and a car bomb, and the keg. You know Mike D'Angelo? He went here. Yeah. Like, Ten years ago? Yeah. Well, it was him, actually, who proposed the $20 keg stand. Oh, it was and him. Yeah. He yeah. filmed it. Good for you. 20 bucks richer. Yeah, uh, it was a good time. Stayed up there for a full minute. Two seconds longer than my college record. Central office called me on Friday while your sorry ass was sulking on the couch. Sean wants to meet with you today at 2.30, preceding an emergency board meeting at 3.30. Uh, Sean is Meltzer, the aforementioned superintendent. Try to keep up? Do you have any idea who might have sent that video to him? They didn't say? Would I have asked you if, I, if they did? Well, you know I'm protected here. Not really. If they think it's severe enough, they'll get rid of you no matter what. Maybe it'd take a little longer to do it, but they'll get it done. Yeah? Well, let's see a video of a teacher doing a keg stand at a bar, yelling profanity, getting sloppy. Yeah, yeah but uh, I've been doing that since I was 16. Now it's just on film. And... The assistant superintendent saw it. And everybody who follows me on Instagram, most of whom are the students, already saw it, so... So it's acceptable? I, I don't think it's acceptable. <laughs> you either have the biggest balls or the smallest brain I've ever seen. I'm really not sure. So are you going to help me here? Depends. Are you still up to teach, even after what I'm sure was more shenanigans last night? Marone looks at Schmidt. There, there were no shenanigans last night. Now, part of me has been waiting for this day since you first started. Little greasy-haired, punk-ass, fresh-out-of-college kid coming in. I knew you weren't solid teaching material, but I let it go. I figured you'd grow up uh, as the years went on. Then you don't know till now, do you? He slowly turns and exits out the main door. Interscene, outside of 7-Eleven, 7 a.m., 90s bubblegum pop plays. Tyler, a scrawny-looking teenage kid with black-rimmed glasses and the hood, and a hood, bops through the main door in his own fun little world. He stops downstage right and vapes. He takes out a Pop-Tart, devours it, and drops the wrapper on the ground. He waits. He takes a vape out of his pocket, pauses, changes his mind, puts it back. Good morning, everybody! It's 7 o'clock a.m., and it's a beautiful day in America's average neighborhood for shit to hit the fan. I don't think there's anything cleaner than quiet. The eggshell canvas of a morning before you, awaiting your design, your possibility, your dream, the light shining on you. It never leaves you. It never leaves me. I have no choice. Against my will, I am internally invincible, powerless, on the brink of disaster. I breathe in. 
Nope. Nope, it didn't work. It never does. Well... He suddenly remembers something. He takes out his phone, taps a few times, chuckles, then puts it back in his pocket. I'll just do what I gotta do. Scene. Period one. A bell rings. Marone sits in silence. Was I wrong? Let me say this. When I share something with people, I see them as people, not students versus adults. And, and that's not a bad thing. I don't think. Other people are like, nah, you can't share this with other kids. You gotta set an example. Well, I do. Just not the example they're looking for. The other kids among them, Billy, Liz, and Creter, start to trickle into the room. Billy's the all-American, Liz is no-nonsense, and Creter burned out a few years back. Let's kick it. The other teenagers take their seats on the opposing counters. Rabble. All right, y'all. All right, y'all. Yo, tool bags! Noise stops. Why is it so hard to shut y'all up at 7.45 in the morning? When I was your age, I didn't wake up before noon, especially not on a weekday. Yo, that video was the dopest thing I have ever seen. Thanks. My dad didn't think so. He said you should be fired. Yeah, he's been saying that since the beginning of the year. Why would he be fired? Um, for getting turnt and posting hey. on the gram. I, I wasn't drunk yet. yet. So, dude, you're going to be in college next year. You'll be seeing that all the time. Not where I'm going. Where are you going? Bucknell. <gasps> Bucknell? Oh, hey, look. The, uh, the beer bus just pulled up outside. Might as well get in there now. Well, I'm not about it. I'm with my dad. I don't think you should have done that. I don't care. Like, people like to have fun. Just because you're our teacher doesn't mean you don't deserve to live. Huh. So what are we doing today? I don't know. What do you want to do today? What do you mean? What? do you want to do today? No, I'm not really asking. I don't know. I'm, I'm asking. It's, it's your education. What are we going to do? That our parents are paying taxes on? I don't know what to say to you about. Okay, all right, listen. It's no big deal. God, we're, we're going to cover all the material anyway, so it doesn't really matter what we do. I just want to try something. Well, I don't know what needs to be covered. Wait, Moreau, uh, question. Wait, Billy, answer. And this is a sidebar. I was talking to my cousin who said she had you, like, five years ago. Uh, Kira McKendrick? Oh, God. You're not related to her. Um, no, that, that's a compliment for you. Go on. Oh, uh, she told me about this demo you did where you dropped a bunch of stuff from the top of the atrium in the entrance, like books, tennis balls, basketballs, ping pong <laughs> balls, like real senior prank shit. Yeah. What was that about? You lose. Uh, he decided today's lesson. No, what needs to be done? To me, curiosity has always been more important than necessity. There's what you need to learn, then there's what I want to teach. And sometimes what I want to teach is more valuable. So what are you going to teach? Okay. Think about it. So that was meant to show the principles of acceleration due to gravity. Notebooks out. Brains on. Let's learn this ish. Earth's gravity, as we know it, can be described as a constant, like it's always there. This is called the constant of gravitational acceleration. And if we want to assign a value to this constant, it would be approximately 10 meters per second squared. Other sources go with 9.81, others 9.8, but generally, if you look, uh, I, and I, I know all you fools who will spend your free time dabbling in physics, 
Yeah, bro. You'll see 10. Creator, you liar. Don't even. No, for real, I do. Your last quiz suggests otherwise. Although I gotta say, lowest score I've ever given out. Congratulations, I think. Uh, who got the highest? Tyler. Of course. Speaking of the tool bag, where is he? I haven't seen him. Anyway, 10 meters per second squared is the gravitational acceleration constant. This means that all objects on Earth, if air resistance is excluded, are going to fall at that particular rate. Wait, so that's like why the bowling ball and the feather will land at the same time when you drop them? You got it, Jack. My name's Billy. You got it, Jack. All objects are going to fall at the same rate, even if they have entirely different masses. But why is it in a vacuum? Why is what in a vacuum? If air resistance is excluded, that's a vacuum, right? Yeah. Right. So when you say everything falls at the same time, why do you say that's the way it is in a vacuum instead of reality? Reality? <laughs> no, no, no. But, wait, reality? I, I mean Earth. Sorry. Okay, okay. You're, you're, you're confusing me, Liz. Earth. Earth. Hey, Dad, uh, I gotta... He catches himself, but it's too late. Marone looks at him. Did you just call me dad? I, I just want... The, want uh, to... You did. You absolutely called me dad. That's a first. Yeah. Nah. I'm not your dad, homie. I'm like your older brother who breaks into your room, gives you a noogie, farts in your face, then goes back to my room and blasts sublime until the neighbors threaten to call the cops. Anyway, what's up? Um... I gotta drop a deuce. <laughs> Thanks for the news. Now, here's Bob with the weather, Bob. Uh, Billy, you are a god among men. When, when you gotta take a dump, you're the one dude I expect to say that. Uh, that's why this class is the only class I can say it in, because you know you don't care. That I do not. It's on my planner. All right. You know, I never got why you guys had to carry these things around. The bathroom's literally right around the corner. The hall monitor can see you walking from my room to the can. They just don't want everybody running around the halls during class. Yeah, because the whole class is gonna stand up at once and go to the bathroom. I mean, you're 18 years old and you gotta go to the you gotta bathroom. What am I gonna do? Tell you no? You wouldn't be the first. He exits. Okay, so where the hell were we? Or where in reality were we? <laughs> Been lost in reality since Trump was elected. Oh, yeah. Air resistance. So even if you drop two objects from the exact same height at the exact same time, air is going to get in the way somehow. A big thing is also how high you drop it. I mean, if you go up 100 feet, you're obviously going to see more difference than if you drop it like five feet. You good? Yes. No. You're... You're not. Demo time, demo time. Everybody, take the heaviest, lightest, and loudest items you can find in this room. Right now. Come on, come on, we don't have much time. Let's go. Kids do so, getting all sorts of random stuff from the walls, counters, etc. Marone runs around, hoping, hopping from lab table to lab table, getting a large gold gladiator helmet, a base basketball, and a couple of old posters. All right, everybody, get on the front counter. The kids of Marone do so. Some kids grab a chair and climb up with it. Okay. On the count of one, we're all going to drop our junk. No. Oh. Hell okay. no. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me. I got a girlfriend. Let me rephrase that. As if you weren't unthanized already. We're going to drop our stuff. We got a good variety of crap here, so it should all hit the relatively at the same time. Any questions? How loud is this going to be? All right, ready? Three, two, one. They drop their things. It makes a pretty deafening sound. The kids laugh. Marone jumps off the counter. My ears hurt. That was so dope. All right, all right. Kids pick, pack up, and gradually exit. All right, don't forget. Read pages 26 to 38. Do one through five. 
Maroon. What? I'm sorry I was such an idiot today. When were you an idiot? I am the only idiot here. It's on for the first page of the syllabus. Well, yeah, but I wasn't thinking and I didn't know anything. Thanks. You're welcome? No, like, if, if you knew everything, I wouldn't have anything to do, right? She smiles. Thanks. <laughs> keep it, keep it up. Peace out. Keep <laughs> she exits. Marone is alone for a moment before Billy re-enters. I heard this big crash while I was on the toilet. <laughs> and you were surprised, homie? Not in the least. My dude. Billy and Marone pound fists. That's one of my favorite demos. It's loud. I like loud things. I don't know anyone else that can get away with that. Uh, cause no one else can. Dude, you have the key to the city. I'm in awe of you every time I walk into this room. Ah, well, I guess you're all right too. So, how is Kira? Good. Uh, she says hi, by the way. Nice. But uh, she got married, uh, so Philly, she moved to Philly with her husband. Has a kid. Wow. Uh, how old? Five. Boy or girl? Boy. Exactly what I would have wanted. That was before we found out that Chris... <laughs> Never mind. What? No, it's personal. Dude, I'm sorry. What is? Nah, I'm not getting personal with you, dude. That's like the main reason I'm in this mess. It's because I overshare like I'm getting paid for it. Maroon, I, I don't mind. Did you ever? Not really. That's why I like you. Do you want to go work in central office? I mean, are you scared about them firing you? You want me to be honest? Well, like, I always think if you post something, you should own it. But I'm just a kid. Just a kid? You know, I don't waste my time with just anyone. I don't spend my days teaching just kids. You feel me? Yeah. No, I don't think you do. I, I just wish there was something I could do. Same, bro. Billy gets his things. Later. He exits. Interscene. Outside of 7-Eleven. 7.05 a.m. Tyler remains in front of the store. Some days, I see myself as a supernova. The energy I burn through my days, flying thousands of miles per hour to my heart, manifesting pressure until it blows my skin out into a blue scorching flame engulfing every limb and orifice. My martyrdom outclowing all the other cosmic bodies, transcending continuums like a holy miracle into the internal memory of all who gave. But supernovas happen at the end of a star's life cycle. That's interesting. Scene. Introspection 1. Marone's getting ready for his next class. He goes over to the closet, opens it, and removes a long board with a thousand nails sticking out of it and a cement block. He places them both up front. He goes back to the closet and removes a sledgehammer, drops it at the same place, looks at the audience. You think I'm a friggin' weirdo, don't you? <laughs> it's whatever. If I get a dollar for every backhanded thing people said about me, yeah, I can match my 401k. And I haven't been teaching for a short time. But God knows why. There are those who stick around. Interesting. Lights change and we see Billy and Liz sitting on the counter doing homework. Barone's the goat. I love him possibly more than I love my own father. Facts. He's freaking insane. For real, though. I'm having trouble remembering what life was like before I met him. Before I met him, I had no idea how to live. Like, I was handling all my assignments in late, and I wasn't academically el eligible to play. It was just bad. I feel that. You too? Yeah, well, I just never got along with any of my teachers before him. Like, everyone just wanted to nail me into the ground. Like, was never any teacher I could just 
keep it real around, you know? But now there is. Because he keeps it real. All the time, always. What'd you get for number seven? I uh, just finished writing my name. And to Brittany, Billy's cute little cheerleader girlfriend. Hi. Hey. They make out. Liz just stares. So should I get some popcorn or? Oh, uh, we're, we're just studying. We? Am I not sitting at this table with you? Uh, it's not like osmosis, though. Like, you actually have to open the book and read it to study? You know what? I think I'm good on that front. Right? Yeah, if you studied physics the way your, study, your tongue studies her molars, you'd be at the top of the class. Well, study party's over. We're going to Dylan's now, and I have something to show y'all when we're there. Scene shifts to the other side of the stage where Billy's bro, Dylan, the class dweeb, Muller, and Creter are chilling in the sta- or chilling in chairs arranged as a couch in Dylan's basement. So, what are you guys doing this weekend? Nothing now. Currently serving two weeks at the Grounded on Murray Street State Prison. So stupid. I just went out last night to see my girlfriend, but I didn't tell my parents because she lives literally around the corner and I was going to be back before midnight. But I guess I can't even do that without a dog collar. Bullshit. Should have listened to your parents. Why am I friends with you again? Because my older sister's dating your brother and she smuggles you cigarettes. That's fair. It's a small price to pay, but it's worth it. I just wish Marone was there. He would step up for me. That's what I love about that guy. Like, when parents bring you down, he's there to be like, see, see you who, as you really are and bring you right, really back up. I don't know if I'd totally agree with that. Then again, I'm the class shit catcher, but he has his shining moments. Nah. Barone knows what's up. He even came to my first football game last fall when I told him my parents couldn't go. When no one else was there for me, there he was. And he sat in the student section, too. I remember that. He went all out that night, head to toe body paint, waved the flag, led cheers. He even crowd surfed. Stole the show. I'm hungry. Whoa, you're alive? I just thought the same thing. Enter Billy, Brittany, and Liz. Hey. Handshakes and greeting. So, I'm sure you've all heard, but before it hits the gram, you saw it here first. Brittany whips out her phone and the kids gather around. Marone swung on a bowling ball. Oh, yeah, he keeps that bowling ball on the ceiling attached to a string and he swings on it. Why? We were learning about momentum. No, like, why does he keep a bowling ball in the ceiling? Because he's fucking Marone. Here it is. Video plays. There's a sound of Marone talking and the kids laughing. (laughs) He is so extra. I love it. Sound of a crash. What the fuck? Yup. (laughs) Was he okay? Oh, yeah. Just a little bruise. I heard one year it snapped, though, and he had to go to the ER. He was out for the rest of the semester. Sucks. Yeah, but that passion. Scene shifts back to Maroon. Like, they could talk about literally anything else, but they just decide to use up their precious conversation space on me? I mean, thanks? I don't know, bro. I'm just me. The idiot who's still sort of drunk and high from the late 90s. You remember? Your friendly neighborhood, spiky hair, weekend warrior, getting fucked up at Maddie Scribner's basement. Finding God in every girl in the cul-de-sac before repenting at the diner at 1 a.m. How far I've come. Except not. Amazing. I mean, I was not a great student. Or even a good student. But like, science just came naturally for me. Somehow. Specifically, physics. I just loved how everything in the natural world had this quantifiable explanation, you know? He snaps. There's physics in that. Kicks the nail board. 
and that. And he body slams the floor. Mm. Okay, yeah, there's, there's no physics in that. I was, I was just messing around. No, I'm kidding. Of course there is. So I don't know if it's the fun shit I do in class or the fact that I share a brain with an eighth grader that makes these guys love me, but I don't know. It's a party. But the cops just bust it up. I guess not everything has a quantifiable explanation. Scene, period four. Dylan, Muller, and others are in the room. One boy is listening to the music on his phone. Marone stands up front. Pause. Hey, what, uh, what's with you guys? Y'all are too quiet today. All right. I'll play Freud. What's going on today? Well, if no one else is going to go, I do have a lot on my mind. All right. Muller? Well, other than being completely and utterly exhausted. I have this history project due Friday, an English paper that same day. I still have to do half of my math homework during lunch, and I forgot my gym clothes. Yo, has anyone told you you're a vanilla soft surge bitch? Yo! What? He is? No, 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 we don't talk to each other like that. Oh, okay. But you can call us tool bags. Okay, that's joking around, though. You straight up hit below the belt. Whatever. Yeah, hey, you got baggage too, homie. Don't even try it. Let's all be nice to each other, all right? There are too many legit tool bags running around. And I'm not just talking about the one in the White House. Why do you care so much anyway? You never did before. Didn't I? He suddenly notices the boy's been listening to the music on his phone this entire time. Old Town Road blasts through his headphones. Everyone turns to face him. He doesn't know we're talking, does he? Nope. No. The kid next to him starts to lean in. Marone stops them. He gingerly saunters in front of him, though he doesn't notice him because he's rummaging through his book bag. He starts to annoyingly lip sync the lyrics to the chorus. He notices. He turns, off, he turns it off and stares at Marone. No. Yeah. Why'd you stop? Oh, they just call me Marone, Nas X. Uh, are you going to listen to that during class anymore? Are you going to be interesting? Well, funny you should ask. Because you know what? Let's try that again. You know what? What? What, Marone? Today, we're under pressure. Well, ding, 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 ding. Into the baseline from Ice Ice Baby. Okay. No, 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 no. That's not Queen. That's Vanilla Ice. It's the same song. Marone starts, stares at him like he's on drugs. Wait, isn't he? <laughs> as a former high school punk rock icon, and as someone that has worn out Queen's greatest hits album on vinyl 30 times over, I vehemently oppose your position on the subject and declare invalid. <laughs> I'll burn you a CD of real music sometimes. Less than Jake. Catch 22. Real big fish. Burn a CD? Yeah. What, why would you do that? What do you mean? If you want to listen to different songs, you, you burn a CD of them. How could you do that if you already burn the CD? If it's burned, you just have the ashes. Okay. Okay, that's enough Gen X terminology for today. Wait, what did you play in your band? I didn't play. I, I sang. You sing? What? No. You don't need to be a singer to be in a band. That was just cute. And went friggin' berserk on stage. What was the name of your band? Rowan. R-O-A-N. It's part of my last name, but like spelled differently because we were alternative like that. Okay, but I digress. What is pressure? What is pressure? Uh-huh. I asked you first. It's pushing. Yeah? He walks over to Muller and gives him a little shove. So this is pressure? What I'm doing? He repeats it continuously. I'll just keep doing this. Just play along. Well, if you want me to play along, it's emotional pressure. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. What am I doing? What am I using, I should say? Force? Marone stops. You guys 
had one job today. One job. And that was to come in with a Star Wars joke the first time somebody said force. Every other class I've ever had pulled it off. But you guys left me hanging. All around me are familiar place faces, worn out places, worn out faces. Anyway, force is an integral part of pressure. So if we were to equationize this muff frogger, it would be Writing pressure over. equals force. And what else could pressure depend on? You know how I shoved Muller just now? Sam and Becca, get up. They do. Oh, don't drag me into this again. Uh, Dylan. What? I, I think Muller needs to be dragged into this again. Don't you? Oh, come on. Ah, make like Nike and just do it. Okay, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna say that again. All right, y'all. Uh, go over to him and push him back and forth between you. Muller, stay perfectly straight. I'm teaching something now. And just, uh, like, bring your arms in. Uh, that's it. I do so. And Dylan, uh, go over and join them. Pass Muller between the three of you. Dylan joins in. So, Muller, what's happening to you now? It's actually not that bad. No, right? What you're feeling from each person is the same amount of force I exerted upon you before. But it doesn't feel as heavy because it's between three people. So what do we call that, tool bags? The force is spread out among an... Plane? Close. Think geometry. Area. Yes. Area is the word. So going back to our equation, pressure equals force divided by area. The unit for pressure is the Pascal, as in Blaise Pascal, the renowned French mathematician. Force, as you know, is the Newton, as in the Fig Newton, the renowned soft cookie, an area is square meter. So when everyone was pushing Muller, the force was a result of how hard everyone pushed. But the pressure was spread out over everyone's efforts. Therefore, we can say he writes. that the larger area over a f which a force is applied, the smaller the pressure experienced around the area. All of Brad Pitt and Inglorious Bastards. Sound good? Yes, sir. Dylan, you got solid taste in movies, homie. I learned from the best. All right, all right, all right. hey, no, nobody likes to suck up. But I thrive off them like a mosquito off blood. All right, tool bags, sit down. Thank you. Demo time, demo time. He points to his stuff downstage. Oh, I heard about this. All right, meet the bed of nails. It's a cut size sheet of plywood with 1,016 penny nails sticking out of it. This was actually a gift from one of the, my professors at New Paltz. Yep, this was a gift. If you haven't met physics people, you haven't met true weirdos. Good thing I'm not one of those. All right, let it lay on top of this. He gets situated on the board. Ah, trust sleepies for the rest of your life. Sorry. Seriously, though. No. This bed isn't as uncomfortable as you think. The reason for that is all the nails are pushing against my body with an equal amount of force. So although it's prickly AF, it's not so uncomfortable that it's unbearable. Now, I need two of you to take the other board that's in the closet and put it on top of me. That one has nails too, by the way. I gotta make it worth all y'all's time. Two kids get up and move the board. Can you tell I was obsessed with jackass in college? You mean you didn't get the idea for, this, for the show from you? That, that, that was good, dude. Nailed it. Muller, get out. Kids, place the board atop Maroon. Yo, man, you look like a s'more. Probably doesn't taste as good. Muller, get the cement block. Muller does so. Put it right on top of me. He slowly does so. Oh, shit. Maroon takes a last breath in as Muller places the cement block atop him. You okay? Yeah. Just gotta find a breathing pattern. All right, Dylan, get the sledgehammer. Why, well, yes, this is a normal class. Why, why do you ask? Dylan takes the sledgehammer. Okay, yep, somebody? 
Go get my do- goggles on the desk. Someone gets them and hands them to him. Muchas gracias. All right, I gotta cover my face. Don't wanna mess up my moisturizer. All right, Thor, come at me, bro. The phone rings, awkward pause. Marone motions to Dylan to get the phone. Dylan slowly moves to it and picks it up. Room 122. Yeah, it's his room, but I'm not him. I'm Dylan. He's busy. No, he is. It, he's just busy. Yeah, sure. He grabs a pencil and paper. Tell him to call back. I'm taking a message. Okay, thanks. He hangs up. That was Chris. Your wife. She wants you to call her. Fine. But you know what you need to do. Break the cement block all over me. You're sure? I'm sure, homie. You're sure you're sure? I said I'm sure. You're really sure? Just smash the damn thing! Dylan hesitates for a second, then lifts the hammer and swings it down on the block. The block shatters. Oh, 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 oh my god! Oh. Dylan drops the hammer and quickly lifts the board off Marone. Marone jumps up into a ta-da pose. Cheers and applause from the class. Look at that. Now, why was I not harmed? Because even though he was hitting you with the hammer, the pressure was evenly distributed across your body, so you didn't get hurt. Man, you tool bags catch on quick. Occasionally. Right, because the nails were spread out among such a large area, I only felt a small amount of pressure because it was evenly distributed. So going back to formula, pressure is dependent upon how much force you're distributing across a certain area. The less force, the smaller the pressure. But the greater the area, meaning more equal force is pushing around you, the greater the pressure. So you don't feel it much. Bell sounds. You don't feel it. I'll be signing pieces of cinder block on your way out. Interscene. Lights change. Music plays. Billy re-enters the classroom with Brittany and meets Dylan for a bro tab. What's up, kid? What up? Yo, I just smashed the block on Marone. Oh, you did that today? He's fucking nuts. Yeah, man. What happened? He does this thing where he lays on top of a board of nails and somebody breaks a cinder block on him. Why? It's to show pressure. And how, like, the more there is spread out among a big area, the less pressure exerts because there's so many equal forces pushing. What's up? Holy shit. Yo, I think I know what to do. What to do? Listen. He pulls Dylan and Brittany in close to softly tell them. Creator and Liz come and come in and see what's going on. Okay. Dude, Dude that, that is justice. Oh my god. Right? Who wouldn't be fucking amazing? Yo, that is bruh. What the hell? Hungry. General inquiries from the others. All right, all right, all right. Here's what's up. They huddle around. Interesting. The 7-Eleven, 10 a.m. Tyler is munching on a taquito. The other day, my guidance counselor told me I'm currently first in my class. Bullshit. I'm not the smartest kid in school. I just know how to work the system. I'm like cool hand Luke, Paul Newman shoving the eggs into his mouth. And when I leave the prison, nobody's going to see me back there for the piss and shit people leave on the toilets. I wish all the work I did had a heartbeat. And I wish I could talk to it, hear what it really thinks of me. But then, I'd probably hate it more. Scene. Chris. Marone's alone again in his room. He pulls out his phone, dials. Chris appears in the office door, exhausted yet composed. She owns every room she walks into in a Snooky-esque sort of way, although she's a couple feet taller. Her phone rings. She pulls it out, hesitates when she sees who it is, then answers. This next exchange doesn't have any pauses written, but the actors should take it at their own slow tempo. Hey. 
Hey, are you okay? Yeah. Where are you? I don't know. What's what's around you? Uh, Wendy's, AutoZone, Dunkin' Donuts. Well, okay, you didn't go that far. Can you drive back? No. You said you were okay. I mean, I don't want to. Don't, don't do this. Please don't do this. Not after you kept me up all night and made me call you like 30 times to see where you were. I, I don't want a repeat of last night either. Do you know how much trouble I'm in right now? I don't want a repeat. I want you here. That's what I need right now. Chris sighs. Marone hears. Okay. I'll come later. Thank you. They hang up. Her first. Marone blankly stares. My wife. We had some problems last night. Chris is a champ. She really is. I'm not the kind of dude who deserves someone like her. Especially after all my bullshit she's put up with over the last years. The last decade. I mean, I don't know. What words could you use to describe someone that just rips your heart, lungs, and voice out? You know, the, the idea that they don't degrade you but you feel unworthy to be with them. Chris enters from the office holding a champagne bottle and a glass. Yo, tool bag. Be a good ride or die and fuck this up with me? Sometimes that works. Scene, spring break last year, flashback. They're sufficiently buzzed. I, <laughs> I can't finish this whole thing myself. Or can I? Yeah, no. I'd like, to, I'd like you semi-conscious for the rest of the weekend. And that's my paycheck we're blowing here. Uh, investing. Can you taste the surprise at the bottom? Marone, take this way. Hold up. Is that weed? Yeah! Well, I didn't get it at the liquor store. It's really fucking good. Really? I didn't think you'd be into it. What do you mean? I mean, um, I thought we'd have a repeat of our last Super Bowl after you had only three Bud Lights. Just saying. Okay, bullshit. I was white boy wasted at that party, and you know it. And I drank it on top of the five-layer Mexican dip, and the buffalo wings, and the spinach dip, and the barbecue chicken pizza. Yeah, okay. Okay, blame it on the wings. What? I'm just saying that I can hold more than that, and I'm a woman. Oh, so the results are finally back from the lab? <laughs> you are such an asshole. No, no, you know what I need? What I really need? Mm. It's for you, my little hairy-legged Irish Italian stallion, to open up all the windows in the house and scream that you love me till your throat bleeds. Or when every dog on the street starts barking, whichever comes first. Then I want you to grab me by the soul. Pull me into that fucked up part of your psyche where we'll be hidden. Treading the edge, about to fall into Elysium and never return, but safe. Safe. Well, can we do that? It would mean a lot to me. Please. She clenches the bottle. That was beautiful. Can you be drunk more often? Wait, what? Oh, let's toast. We move in for the toast. No, no. We gotta link arms like we did in the wedding. How did we link arms? Marone does it for her. Okay. They chug the rest of their champagne. They stare at each other. 
you know what's next, right? Yep. Couple kids have put a small mattress, sheets, and pillow on a group of desks. Maroon and Chris run over to it and jump on it. <laughs> Let's jump! I haven't done this since I was like seven. I haven't done it since I was like 28. They both stumble to their knees in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Their eyes meet, silent fireworks. They slowly move in and begin kissing. As the kissing grows deeper, she starts caressing his erogenous zones. Like that? Yeah. You like this? He deeply kisses her neck. What's your fantasy? This. Right now. Only, instead of you, it's Jason Momoa. The fuck, Jason Momoa. Thanks, I'd love to. Okay, sounds like I gotta work harder. He kisses her neck and lays her down. He mounts her, more kissing. As he unbuckles his pants, he notices she's not mentally there. Uh, what's up? Chris looks at him. You're gonna tell your class about this. Whew, okay, I'll take a buzz kill for a thousand, Alex. No, I'm serious. You tell your class about us. Chris, what the fuck? Oh. Yes, I tell them about us having sex every single day. Yes, of course you I'm do. not gonna tell you them might as about well this. You broadcast every other detail of your life, like CNN. <sighs> okay, um, this is coming from absolutely nowhere, but I'll I'll I'm roll with it. Tired of watching my back around you. Well, Chris, you know I'm an open book. Always have been. For sure. No, many teachers that live their lives like a perpetual MTV spring break. Yeah, I, I prefer TRL. For real. So, is there anything you have inhibitions about? Yeah, if there was, I wouldn't be worth anyone's time. Hell. But the kids need a hero, Chris. A, a hero. You. <laughs> hey, uh, what's so funny? <laughs> right now. You're drinking champagne laced with weed, and you smell like dick cheese. Wow. Oh, look, there's a phone booth. Just run in and put your little Superman outfit. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm not a hero in that sense. Maybe I'm a hero because I'm real. Maybe I'm a hero because I'm a real-ass idiot who would run headfirst into a dark room if need be for my students. And at least I know that. At least I wear that like a badge. Yeah, maybe it's not the most sterling badge in the world, but it's my badge. How many other badges did you see when you taught? What? You'd, you'd run into a, a dark room for them, huh? If you can't have a child of your own to do it for? Yeah, don't, don't do that. He embraces her. We tried. When am I gonna find something to be positive about? You will find something. Yeah, last time I checked, nobody's beating down the door to hire more elementary art teachers. Dr. Ramstadter just couldn't retire without eliminating a few more positions, could he? He always liked cutting jobs for the sake of the budget, but the new guy won't be like that. Who is it again? Sean Meltzer, one of my former students. Nice kid. You still never know which way the wind blows. I, that's why I wish you'd be more careful. I'm caught in a bind here. What do you mean? Who am I supposed to be then? I'm gonna wise up at the expense of myself? Even though you know what happened to me? I, I know, but this is me. Let's watch Netflix. Y you don't wanna... No, no, not really. Come on, we gotta clean up. She goes. So... Interesting. Schmidt can be seen inside the office door making copies. Muller's outside the door. Billy and Brittany approach. Yo, Muller. Do something for me? He hands Muller a flyer. Make copies. What? what? Are you out of your mind? No. I'm excited. It's gonna be turned. You think you can pull this off? No. I know I can't. Your funeral, not mine. How many flyers? I don't know, a few hundred at least. 
Okay, and why am I doing this? Because clearly you have the biggest balls of everyone I know. And you're smart. And yeah. Brittany nods. It's because you don't want to, right? Of course. (laughs) (laughs) Won't we get into trouble? No, because you won't get caught. I don't know. Come on, bruh. Easy, easy. just go in there and make copies. But we're not supposed to use the copier, it's just the teachers. Billy pulls out a $20 bill. Well, Andrew Johnson says we can use it. Jackson, that's Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is on the $20 bill. Just take it and make the copies. No, you make them yourself. Starts to walk away, but Brittany pulls a Snickers bar out of her purse. Mother, you hungry? Mother sees the Snickers bar and rushes back to them. She pulls it away. Ah, ah, ah. Pulls to the flyer. She points to the flyer. Mother gets it and relents. You think 500's okay? Perfect. Mother takes the flyer. Schmidt leaves the office with a folder of copies. Yo, go in, go in. As Schmidt looks through his folder to take inventory, Mueller rushes in. Yo, I love you. Not as much as Muller loves Snickers. Oh, yeah. They start making out. At that moment, Creter approaches the couple holding a plastic bag. I got it. For real? Dude. It's good, too, yeah. Let me see. He looks in the bag. Schmidt turns to watch them. Yo, that's dope. How much you want for it? Don't worry about it. For real? It's for the cause, yeah. Fucking legit! Don't let it go to waste. Yeah, no, I will put it to good use. Can I see? You want to go into the bathroom? Why? Let's just do it here. No, but... Billy reaches into the bag. Schmidt quickly approaches them, but when he sees Billy remove an apple, he stops. I thought it was a surprise. They didn't have Granny Smith. Those are bigger. Said apples. <sighs> Whatever, man. It, it, it's Gucci. Tell the other people to get some. I'm hungry. Well, it fl- leaves the office with flyers. This is my Snickers. Yo! Merry Christmas! Take them. Billy and Creeter takes them. Great. Now hand the rest out. And here you go. Second breakfast. As he begins to devour the Snickers, Sean Meltzer, gym teacher turned administrator, enters with authority. He looks like any attractive guy you've seen in a suit on the cover of GQ. He's subscribed to it for years. Let's get to class, guys. Come on, let's go. The kids go. Meltzer sees Schmidt. Mr. Schmidt. Morning, Mr. Meltzer. 2.30, we said, right, with Mr. Marone? Yes. He's stopping by his room in a minute to remind him. Okay. Take care. He starts to go until... (sighs) Mr. Meltzer, I'd like to be there for your meeting with him. Uh Uh-huh. As department chair, I think I should, right? Okay. Awkward pause. How's it going? How's your cold? The the one I had two months ago. It's getting better. Two months already? I feel feel like I've seen you since then. Uh, no. I haven't seen you. Guess that's central office. They lock you up, and if you're good, they'll let you out once a quarter to play outside and get ice cream. (laughs) He laughs at his own joke. Schmidt isn't down with it. I'll see you later. He goes. Schmidt looks back at him and exits through the classroom door. He re-enters with a smidge of icing on his face. Marone, sitting at the desk, looks up at him. What's with the apples? I don't know, man. They're a nutritious fruit, rich in vitamins and minerals. You could use them for pie, turnovers. Uh, A uh, couple of your guys just emptied the cafeteria supply of them. Yeah, I've been in there. I've been in here. He gets up. Yo, what the hell's that? Icing? Uh, That's icing. 
He goes over to him and wipes it off his face while Schmidt resists. Get off! It, it was Irene's birthday in guidance. They had cupcakes. And were they moist and delicious? If I'm still wearing it, they must have been sensational. I'm taking your beaker. Whoa! Uh, oh, are, are you doing that today? Demo time, demo time! And it starts into the office. Just make sure nothing splatters all over your class like it did last year. Yeah, I think some water got in when I was mixing the sodium, and that's why I went kaboom. Yeah, remember that time that I did the demo? Uh, sprinkle that shit all over the soccer field, and then when the sprinkler is turned on... He makes a little exploding noises. <laughs> that was killer. The soccer teams had to play the rest of their season away. I remember the coach. Uh, da, 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 what's his name? Bannon wanted to rip me a new <laughs> asshole. <laughs> it glares that. That was the first year I taught chemistry. That was the only year you taught chemistry. Schmidt exits into the office. Marone organizes papers for a second until Meltzer appears in the doorway. Marone sees him, stops dead. Scene, Meltzer. Mr. Marone, how are you? What's good, Sean? I filed the charge with Debbie. School board secretary. Yeah, I know. I got the email from her on Friday. Of course, we'll be meeting before the board hearing. I know. I was briefed. Schmidt leaves the office with the beaker. He stops when he sees the two men. Excuse me. He exits and closes the door behind him. Marone takes a second. Who sent you that video? What? Who sent you the video? I can't tell you that. It was referred to me by a third party. That's all you need to know. No, it's not, homie. What third party? A teacher? Student? It's not important, Mar Mr. Marone. Yeah, I love this transparency with administration. Uh, what do they call it? Conduct unbecoming. Right. Those were the grounds for the charges. Yeah. yeah and, and who makes those rules, man? Who decides what's unbecoming? Come on, man. The state. All right. Okay. And where do you stand? What's unbecoming to you? Whatever's against the state. I said you, toolbag. Watch it. Once my student, always my student, homie. So what do you believe to be right? I mean, ethically, there are standards we need to hold our teachers to. You get that. Oh, okay. Like the standards I held you to. But you couldn't be bothered with since you were wandering the halls and making out behind the dumpsters during my class. And you know what, Sean? You've been in this district almost as long as I have, right? For my first year, right? Then you come back after college and haven't left. You know what I'm about by now, dude. Yeah, me and everyone else. But knowing you and liking you are two very different things. Bro, I don't care whether you like me. Do you respect me? I respect our kids. Well, if you respected me, you would have come to me first about this. After everything you've done? Marone, come on. Where most teachers have, fold, have a folder of incidents, you could have a cabinet. And aside from this kind of stuff, I want to say your past few performance reviews have been kind of shoddy as well. And you say, I owe you something? Okay, you weren't there to give them, Sean. And what's the criteria for the performance review? Maybe my methods don't conform exactly to your standards. But what does it matter when, at the end of the day, my kids do well? And they love coming here. Matters because of those standards. You respect them more than me and the students. That's all there is to it. They're there for a reason. No, you think the rules that you enforce are absolute, higher than God. And tool bags like me are just here to enforce them without question or creativity. And it doesn't matter which tool bag, just anyone, regardless of the track record in the district. Maroon, calm down. You did bad shit, all right? This is what you get. Look, 
There's a lot of bad stuff going around these days, but I can't control that. We can't control that. So I got to make sure we're putting our best foot forward for the kids and represent ourselves in the best way. And you say, I don't. You say all these other people aren't half the asshole I am and half as subversive. Subversive? That's what I said. Yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you want to say I'm public enemy number one? Yeah. Unbelievable. Marone, there are 1,500 kids in this building above alone we got to watch for. So every teacher in this building has to pull their own weight in every way they can, especially you. I don't have time for bullshit. I have a responsibility to the state. Yeah, Sean, the, the state doesn't care about you or your white horse, just FYI. Oh. You're just a pawn, a sheep. So the kids love you, Marone. That's awesome. There are also more adults that don't. The fact that the kids love you doesn't mean a thing when you match it up against a moral code. You walk outside that bar you were at it last week and there's a big world out there that's mean and nasty and thinks they know what's best for kids. But then there's us who actually does. We have degrees and career experiences that prove it and everything. So we have to stand ground. Bullshit, dude. After all the years I've shown up and taught hundreds of kids to success, you're gonna look me in the eye, in the eye, and tell me I'm not cutting it anymore? Now, after everything? It's not just me. Not just me. I mean, you don't think we have every right to be unhappy with you right now? And we have every right to take action into our own hands. I mean, if you know, if you knew how many were let go in our district alone last year. I do. Sorry. I, I forgot. I don't want to continue this discussion. Uh, so we're, we're meeting here at 2.30. Yep. And, um... Steve has requested to join me for it. Schmidt. Yeah, I know his name. Marone. Mr. Meltzer. Are you even sorry? Of course I am. That you won't let me be and we're here. Didn't come in here to fight. <laughs> hey, you also didn't come in here to bring a get well card. I feel like you don't need one yet. Yes. You know, the year after I graduated high school, I worked at a music store, Cash's Music, selling guitars and drums and shit to all the kids in town. And some of their parents I dealt with were real assholes. If you've ever worked retail, you know, right? And every night I would complain to my dad about all these pricks that came into the store. And one night he just said, these people are fighting wars you know nothing about. Sometimes I wonder if that's entirely true for him. It damn well might be. Interesting. At 7-11, 11.30 a.m., Tyler pulls out his phone. All right. Guess I'll head out. This is that cliff, isn't it? That the spirits of people walk around the world waiting to jump off. Some walk away. Others plummet into obliteration, but not before grabbing someone to take down with them. I don't feel regret. I don't feel anything. He goes back to Marone. Oh, uh, I never told you about Chris. This all came at a time that was less than ideal. We've been on edge as is since Chris lost her job in this district at the end of last year, right as the old assistant superintendent left and Meltzer came in. And last night. Dean, last night, Chris and Marone sit at the table eating baked ziti. Silence. More silence. And in case there wasn't enough already, silence. Marone looks at Chris. Is this the part of the weekend you'll, where you'll actually talk to me? where we can talk about it. 
Okay. I'll keep waiting. How about now? Chris dropped her fork. Why am I angry, though? Chris, I, no, I, I really... No, it's not worth it. I, I saw this coming from a million miles away. When they called yesterday, I, I wanted to disbelieve it, but I don't have the kind of life with you where I could. I'll, great job. You reap what you sow. She takes her plate and brings it to the sink for washing. You're not even fighting me, huh? I don't blame you. Why would I fight you? Because you've been doing that as long as you've been living. Me, the staff, the administration, your students. You always have to have the biggest dick. And most of the time, you come up small. <laughs> okay, that, that's cheap. That is fucking cheap. Tell me the way I act yeah. doesn't make me even a pretense of a man. Doing bullshit. Yeah, that's for sure. For, uh, fucking running out on a weeknight to get wasted with kids you had 15 years ago. What kind of man does that? I did. They took away my job. I would have thought you'd be on your shit to not fuck up in any way. And it hurts. It just grinds me to a pulp that you don't care enough not to. She starts out of the room. Chris. Let me guess. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? Like, I've always had to tell you what to be. When are you going to know that for yourself? I know. You don't. Yeah. There's a lot I don't know. I won't deny it. Just like I won't deny the fact that I'm committed to you. Just like you are to me, despite myself. If you weren't, you would have been out a long time ago. What? Can we not? Can we just not? She goes to take the dish of ziti off the table. Chris, why are you... you... George, just stop. No, what, what's going on, Chris? Just stop! No, I, I wasn't finished. Get, get stop! Finished. He wrestles the dish out of her hand. Chris, okay, you make the dish and let's sit back down. Fucking just stop. What, what are you doing? Fuck off! The dish comes loose and shatters all over the floor. God damn it! He kicks the table and sinks into a chair. What is going on? Chris slowly goes to her husband and sits next to him. George. I need to tell you something. Marone looks into her eyes. Chris, I've known maybe eight really strange, crazy women in my life. And you're five of them. But that doesn't matter, all right? You're my main babe. And I'm always going to love you. There's another man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> How long? About a month. Do I know do I know him? Chris? Probably not. <laughs> uh, I'm too exhausted to even He stands. He's on the verge of breaking down. <laughs> I'm 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 sorry. She stands and exits out the classroom door. <sighs> a minute later. The tire screeched. The engine roared down toward the boulevard. I called the cops after midnight. And she wasn't even missing yet. So I gave up around five. Fell asleep on the couch. Slept through my alarm. Shot up into a cold shower. Made a sandwich. With a couple pieces of cheese for breakfast. Came here. I feel like our lives are intrinsically, in some way, shape, or form, always mundane. And even though our lives don't always love us back, we need to love it somehow. And I can honestly say I do. But someone has to be there to love it with me. <laughs> Yo, I'm, I'm done teaching today. Interesting. Cafeteria. Billy, Brittany, Creeder, Liz, and Dylan sit around a table. I feel like you guys have done everything. Yeah, for real. Flyers are out. Twitter's popping. 
I told everyone I know. Same. But what's with the apples? <laughs> You'll see. What did you tweet? Oh, hold up. He pulls out his phone and looks up to see Tyler walking in. Uh, sup, Tyler. Uh, where were you this morning? Not here. Yeah, no shit. Where? What, what are you, working with the Russians? All right. Yo, you hear about this? He holds out a flyer to him. No. Where's Marone? You try his room? No. That would be a good place to start there, my man. Tyler goes. Fuck you too, bro. Forget him, babe. He always does that shit. I, like, I try to be nice, but... He looks at his phone. Another two retweets. Hey, <laughs> get it! Hungry. If you pull this off, he's gonna die. Scene. Introspection 2. Marone in the classroom. His shoes off, lounging in a chair. Schmidt comes in, goes to the back office, gets his coat, and leaves without even acknowledging Marone. I was a teenage drug addict. Promiscuous. Prone to violent fights. I was homeless for a few days. His mom and dad threw me out. I cheated death. My wife miscarried. Before we find out that she couldn't actually have kids. I've broken bones more times than I can count on two hands. I've even had a piercing ripped out of my left nipple when I was moshing at Warp Tour. And those were nothing compared to how shitty I feel now. Maybe because all this isn't fucking with me. But with the reason I, why I'm here, transcending anything I am, whoever was, without that, someone's just a body. Not even a vegetable. I don't believe what they say about God not putting you through anything you can't handle. Shit's still here, still there long after. Your heart might be beating. Your brain might still be thinking. Hopefully. But you're still broken. Like, what do you do to move past that? Well, I do. But I always have. Teach. teach. Teach to live. To inspire. To love. To dive headfirst into catharsis every single moment of my day. <laughs> and I hear like these Sonic the Hedgehog ring jingles in my head every time a kid laughs or cheers and this glow in my stomach when I know I'm not the same piece of shit kid I used to be. And I'm that much closer to heaven, you know? Hold up. Let me show you something. He goes to his desk and pulls out a letter. Yeah. This is something Schmidt wrote to me at the end of my first year of teaching here. And I kept it ever since. Like, I'm not even sentimental. But for some reason, this stuck. Schmidt appears in the office door. June 23rd, 2006. Marone, consider yourself lucky. Not because you made it to the end of your first year alive, but this is the first time I've ever written one of these things. And if it goes well, probably won't be the last. I can't remember, I can't remember. the last time I saw so much of myself in someone else. That is before I saw you the first day of school. Looking like you didn't wash your shirt after you unwrapped it or even shampooed your hair. But that was me back around 1991. I couldn't decide between Springsteen or Brian Adams. The nerves always kick in when you bring on a new teacher. <laughs> in your case, though, I felt like Shelley Duvall in The Shining right before Jack Nicholson breaks in with the ax. But when you got going, and in the weeks and months and parent and principal phone calls following, you exploded. Literally, too, as I saw that one day when you zoomed down the hallway on my office chair, leaving the rest of us in the wake of the fire extinguisher you were holding. I feel like so many of the scientists we teach the kids about became who they were 
not merely because they were curious and smart, because they didn't care. They knew what they had to do and they did it. And then listen to anyone who didn't like how they did it. It's that stubbornness, I think, and that fearlessness that, that moves us forward that lets us know we're doing what we should be doing in this lifetime. I'm pretty sure you don't need any validation from any of us anymore, but in case you still do, consider this that. It's been a great year with you, sir. And although I'm sure you'll make a lot of people unhappy when you come back next year, I think you'll make even more people unhappy if you don't. Have a great summer. Hope to catch you around. Steve. Uh, uh, P.S. Don't ever bring me to that restaurant again. Next time you can do your own nuclear wing challenge. Schmidt exits. Marone puts away the letter. I don't know what happened. I guess being in the trenches with these guys, building these relationships doesn't mean shit. You gotta consistently play by the rules, not make your own. <laughs> Who was the dude in the letter? Can someone hold me? He looks at the clock. <sighs> Shit. It's lunchtime. He goes into the office, then comes right back out. It's in my car. As Marone gathers his bag and keys, the scene shifts to Tyler, vaping him behind the dumpster and munching on another Pop-Tart. I can only imagine how many kids were conceived back here. Never been back here. I sure get around, don't I? From center stage of the auditorium accepting an academic award to kicking it with the flies and last week's chicken nugget. Maybe it's fitting. After today, there'll be nowhere for me to go but up. BRB. Get comfy. Don't touch anything. If any of y'all have a cardi on you, I'll do a rum and coke with lunch. Just swap out the coke with Stoli. He leaves the room. The scene shifts back to the dumpster where Tyler starts singing Stabbing Westward. I don't know how this goes, so I'm going to be speaking it. <laughs> I know that you've been damaged. Your soul has suffered such abuse. But I am not your savior. I am just as fucked as Fuck. Marone re-enters the room. I cannot save you. He slips his shoes back on and re-exits. A light comes up downstage left on Meltzer. He picks up his cell and dials after a few seconds. Hey, Jim. John. Listen, keep your eye on the cafeteria. Everyone's smuggling apples out for some reason. Yeah, I know why. Great. All right, great, let's get it done. Scene shifts back to Tyler. I can't even save myself. So just save yourself. He takes another drag of his vape, breathes in, stares into space, blackout. End of act one. Act two, scene, lunch. Marone and re-enters with his lunch. Yo, yo. Sorry to keep you waiting. I was having kind of a pissing contest in the parking lot with this other teacher, Mrs. Kleiner. She, she teaches Spanish, and she was coming at me like, how could you be so stupid? I would never do something like that. This school has never seen something so disgraceful. Which is funny, because this school has never seen something more hilarious then the one time her students locked her in her own closet. She's like, three foot nothing. So it was easy. It happened like 10 years ago, but the kids still talk about it. Rumor has it, she keeps a phone in there, just in case. He plops up anyway, on the park counter. Just because your life is heading down the highway to hell on the hot mess express, doesn't mean you still can scrounge your, together your favorite chow. Spaghetti with chicken fingers, Brussels sprouts, and A1 sauce. He holds it up for the people in the audience to see. Yeah, it's much better when it's warm. But I don't heat it up. I eat it cold. My middle school baseball coach, coach told me that cold food is more nutritious. 
And that's why I don't bother heating things up. That's also why Chris does most of the cooking. He starts to eat, but... Shit. And all the fork. Don't judge. He sticks his fingers, his fingers in it and pulls a bunch of spaghetti out. He slurps it as grossly as possible. Oh, this is the night. Well, listen, if, if y'all don't like this, call Pizza Hut for me or something. I love Pizza Hut, especially like the stuffed crust. I just eat the crust and then throw the rest of it, uh, pizza away. Actually, I like to dip it in mayonnaise and then put ketchup on it and sprinkle it with a little garlic powder. It's delicious. You know, I take great pride in the fact that I have the diet of a woman in her third trimester. Yeah, write that in your little notebooks. Fact one, Marone eats like a pregnant woman. The more you know. No, don't call Pizza Hut. I hate Pizza Hut. He continues to eat happy as a clam. So like... Mm. I still, I still know who you are. Yes, whatever. I'm, ah, I'm glad you stuck around. You're pretty chill. Not that you've said you know, anything this whole time, but you're listening. That feels nice. I need it. I feel like you're the only people around that do. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about, right? Listening to your students your teachers, your colleagues, your staff. And I don't mean like listening, like just hearing them out. No, I'm talking like an avatar. Remember, remember, I see you really understanding each other. I read this quote once. I forget who said it. Yeah, I think it was some old white dude, but as soon as we find each other, we invite the miracle to begin. Like if we stopped worrying, about these unwritten rules of who we have to be and what we got to do just to be allowed to set foot in a classroom. Think of how we can really shape these kids. Kids. I hate that word. I would rather say young adults. I mean, I can do that because my classes are all upperclassmen, but you know, I think back to when I was that age and like, I was tired of people acting like I was just some stupid freaking toddler. Granted, looking back, I acted like one most of the time. <sighs> but still, there was so much more to me, so much potential. And I see the same in my guys. They're real, like I've always been. I've always been unapologetically me. Hundo P, as these tool bags say. And it seems like it's done okay by me and Schmidt and this department up until now. Why can't it be okay for the guys I teach? Why do I have to compromise myself for the sake of my students? So I don't just walk on eggshells laid by people who aren't even in my classroom to see what we do, to see how much fun we have. I would have loved a teacher like me when I was in school. I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I just wanted someone to listen, to see me, to get me. Maybe things would have been different. He slurps more spaghetti. It is what it is. Interscene. Schmidt grading labs in his office. The phone rings. He answers. Steve Schmidt. Uh, hey, Sean. Yes, I vaguely remember. I'm not kidding. What's up? He listens. His face sinks more and more every second. Uh, okay, I... Well, I can't say I'm familiar with that rule, but, uh... Interesting. Uh, and this isn't open for any sort of discussion? Okay, I, I'm, well, I'm still having trouble wrapping my head around this, but, uh, all right, uh, uh, okay, thanks. He hangs up, sits quietly for a moment, 
scene shifts back to Marone. Well, this spaghetti is delicious, but it is filling. Look, if you want it, I can just leave it for you in the fridge to take home. Just bring me back the Tupperware. He goes into the office with the food. Tyler enters through the door and slowly moves to the right side counter, leaning up against it. Marone comes back out and stops, surprised at the sight of him. Scene, Tyler. Sup, tool bag? Where were you today? I was sick with something, so I, I, I went to see someone. <coughs> that is so vague and such a lie. For real, though, where were you? I overslept. Okay. Well, you didn't miss much today. We just went over the answers to the last quiz, and then we... Mom? Yeah, uh, end of the... What? How are you? <sighs> you know, shit-tastic. It's like Monday on crack. Hmm. Crack, huh? Wouldn't you be the one to know? Yeah, okay, that was mildly inappropriate, but I'll let it slide. Are you all right? I'm good now. What does that mean? Now that you're in good hands, well, good is subjective, I, I, I guess, but you're in the right hands. Okay, what? And I'm sure a reformed punk like you knows that when you light a match, it's always fun to watch the fire. That's why I'm here today. I lit the match, and I'm going to watch you burn. Wait, did you? Just because your profile is set to private doesn't mean people still can't see it. Tyler, are you serious? I wish I weren't. Why did you do that? C come on, Marone. Don't you know the rule? If you don't want to show your assistant superintendent, don't put it on social media. Okay, how did you even get it? There's an app where you can go download other people's stories. I got the app, got your video, and then emailed it to Meltzer. Wait, okay, how do you know his email? It's not hard. It's Meltzer at... It, it follows the formula. For a guy with advanced science degree, you're not too bright. Okay, do you know how much you mess things up for me? Yes, I do. And that's why I'm here. But do you know how much you fuck things up for me? Okay, what are you talking about? The exam last week! If I just barely passed it, I would have scored a B- minus for the marking period. But since you failed me, I finished with a C+. Plus. I have never, never gotten anything less than a B-minus in my life! Nah, homie. You earned that failing grade. Sorry to say. Dude! <laughs> For real! You want to believe that your entire freaking life will be thrown out of whack because you get one shitty grade, one marking period? It will! It'll screw up my college applications and my, and my parents! My parents are gonna... years from now. My dude, nobody, especially you, is going to give two shits what you got in what and when. Yeah, you're one to talk. It's not like you ever gave two shits to begin with. You're so busy being like some Blink-182 reject <laughs> that you can't even fathom a pretense of understanding of what I go through. And you know what the worst thing is? You don't care. You make me the class fucking punching bag all day, every day, just so you can be the prom king and expect me to take it. Well, time's up. You just think I'm a punchline. That is so not true, man. <laughs> and that's the thing. I feel like all everyone ever sees me is as a Good student. Yeah, awards are good, awards are nice, but that doesn't speak to who I am. That doesn't speak 
to my raisin entra and all that stuff I want to accomplish in this lifetime. I mean, if, if, I, if I don't drop dead first. I'm burnt, dude. Every fucking day. It's, it's just like... It's just like more tests and projects and this and that and the other thing and you all care more about getting it done than me potentially disintegrating without a trace. You see this? You see my face? This is you staying up until 12.30 every night beauty regimen I work with. This is who I am. I feel like I live in my own private Schlockson novel. I just work, and work, and work my ass off! And what do I get? Okay, I work that hard too. I'm up that late grading quizzes and labs and shit. I don't get crazy 24-7. And dude, if you think it's gonna stop now, you're tripping. But a guy like you, smart, driven, it'll pay off. Will it? I have cousins that were in the same boat as me not too long ago. And where did their work get them? The unemployment line. And thousands and thousands of dollars in deferred loans. So what? What will pay off? Okay, I mean, you get out of this life what you put in. And you sure put a lot in. Not, not always. N not really. And you should know. You remember Mrs. O'Neill? She retired sure. last year? Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't have any favorite teachers, but I liked her a lot. And on her last day here, I tried to say goodbye. She was in the office and I saw her rip her name off of the mailbox and walk out and disappear into the throng of kids. Silent. Isolated. That was the last time anyone saw her. And that was the end of an illustrious 30-year career. Like she was never even here! Is that what you get out of this life? No one said a word to her! Do you have anything to say? Nah. I don't owe you any conversation. <clears throat> Not me, you don't. Tyler starts out. Ty. You know the derelict I once was, right? You know how much shit I wallowed through and how many times in my life I've been within the devil's grasp. No straight A's, no 4.0 GPA or whatever could have saved me from any of it. But one night, Super Bowl Sunday, I collapsed in front of my building and this nice girl found me and took me up to her place for a shower and hot chocolate. Two years later, I married her. And then, none of the shit, none of the grades or the work or anything anyone ever said or did to me, or any joke that I was made the butt of mattered in the slightest. They still don't, and never will, because at the end of the day, we're here, and we're beautiful, all of us. It took me some time to realize that, and I'm giving you a head start. Tyler turns and goes. Well, maybe I did have something to say. But oh, fuck it. I got something to prove. Scene period seven. Kids come in, Brittany among them, and Marone stands at the front. 16. 87. Sir Isaac Newton publishes the scientific principles of natural philosophy, in which he introduces writing on the board the three laws of motion. Now, you toolbags should know the story of the apple falling on his head. 
but I know for a fact that's not true. Schmidt was there shaking the branch. Somebody laugh. Somebody does. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here for the next 10 minutes. Anyway, okay. The three laws of motion. Law of the foist, any object moving at a constant velocity or at rest will remain in that state unless acted on by an unbalanced force. When, a for when an object is moving, it's headed wherever it's headed and it's never supposed to stop. And it's gonna go that way until something changes its path. And when that happens, its path will be forever different. Similarly, if an object isn't moving at all, the unbalanced force will come in and blam, make that sucker move. Law number dos. The net force on an object causes it to accelerate. If a force acts on an object, it'll add an extra push to that object, meaning it'll have an increased velocity, whether it was moving or not. And that object will accelerate in whatever direction the force is moving. The third and final law, if an object exerts a force on another object, the other object will exert an equal and opposite force back. Demo time, demo time. He takes an egg from under the counter. This is your brain. He points it to his scalp. This is drugs. He cracks the egg on his scalp and puts it in the mug on the counter. Any questions? That was our cross-curricular activity for today. Nah, but you do know what I mean by that. What do I mean? Brittany, talk to me. Well, the egg came down on your scalp, so that was like, that was that downward energy coming down on the scalp. And the scalp was like, I'm going to take you out and put the same force on the egg. And it broke. I'm going to take you out. Straight. Thug. I didn't chose the physics life. The physics life chose me. All right. All right. So next. Wait. What makes the force unbalanced? What do you mean? You said unbalanced force. Why is it unbalanced? Never thought about it. Um, okay. An unbalanced force. Okay, well, an, a balanced force means that two objects are clashing against one another. And gives, each gives the other an equal, an opposite force. So a balanced force is one of those forces, and the unbalanced force just comes out of nowhere and changes the path of things. It's different than the other force or, or forces. He, it is not an equal force, and it has no opposition. Never? Nope. Nothing. Bell rings. The kids start to leave. OK, uh, ho hold up, all of you. Come here. The kids gather around Marone in a huddle. OK. So you all know what's going down, right? General murmurs of affirmation. There's lots of things I want you guys to remember about me. The demos, the laughing, the messes we made, the trouble I got into. Generally, that I'm out of my friggin' mind. But none of that really matters. I want you to remember one thing. That I cared. I always did. And so should you. Always. Peace out. He retreats into his office. The class slowly exits. Marone re-enters and hooks his phone up to the computer. Well, other than get my shit together, the only thing that's left to do is play a song. He hits play. Good by Better Than Ezra blares throughout the room. As this is happening, Brittany pulls out her phone and texts Billy on the other side of the stage with Liz and Dylan. He gets the text and looks at both of them. Let's do it. They go. Marone dances around, gets folders together, then realizes he doesn't care and throws a huge wad of papers into the air from the center of the room. He goes back into his office. The stage is empty for a moment. 
Suddenly, Chris appears in the front door. She gingerly, he, he gingerly saunters in, unsure of where her husband, uh, unsure of where her husband is or where she is for that matter. When he reappears, he stops dead in his tracks. He turns off the music. Scene, melee. The two stare at each other. After a few moments. I went out. Okay. Hi. How are you? Are you all right? How are you feeling? No, 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 no. I came in here to rip off the Band-Aid, and now I'm... Yeah, no. This is going to require a little bit more conversation. No. I'm, I'm not going to hurt you any more than I have already. Yeah, you're talking to a former teenage masochist, so George, that's I'm not really... I'm fucking another dude. I mean, that's some form of insanity, isn't it? To still want to be with your wife when she's cheating on you? I am sort of insane. Okay, now let's sit down and no. talk. No. She moves toward the door. Marone runs after her and pulls her back. She resists. Finally, she smacks him on the face. What the fuck? Chris starts crying. Marone moves over to console her when Meltzer enters. Mr. Marone, I... He stops at the side of Chris. Hey. What are you doing here? <laughs> no, his name's Sean. Marone looks at the two of them. What's going on? How do you guys know each other? George. It's him. Marone nearly collapses. <laughs> what? What the f- what George, the fuck? Marone, wait, 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 Marone, I- I- Out! Out! I'm going, I'm going. He goes. Marone slams the door behind him and turns to Chris. I'm serious! Oh, my god. What is going on? I am 50 shades of fucked up right now. You are! Okay, okay. Okay, let's breathe. Cool heads prevail. Okay, number one, his name is Sean. He said on Tinder his name was Mike and he worked in finance. Okay, no and hell no. Number two, he's trying to fire me and replace the dude who fired you. Oh, I could be sick. I, I haven't been around here. I wouldn't have known he was Ramstadter's replacement by looking at him. Okay, cheating on me is one, one thing. But the fact you're doing it with the dude who wants me gone. George, I... I I can't, I, I just, I just can't be here right now. I'm so fucking confused and I, I can't make a conscious decision when my mind's all over the place. You're confused. All right, well, let's make it semi-simple. Just tell me why. Um, it doesn't matter. I'm... I'm not the woman you need right now. I'm not the woman who can give you sympathy and love and sex and whatever else you need. My career did this. It's made me this little shriveled demon lady that no one would notice if she just vanished without a trace. That's bullshit. No, George, what's bullshit is how I've wasted the past decade thinking I was so undeserving of happiness. But now, finally, I know what I need to do to get it. I know how happy my brother was when he divorced his wife. Chris, what are you talking? You can't just make a decision like that on, on your own. We've had a life. Yeah, but at the end of the day, we're broken. And all we can give each other in this world we're in is pain. You want to keep living like that? No, because we don't. I still want to be in this. We need to be in this. See, this is what I'm talking about. Just more and more denial. If we had a life where all we did was bring each other down, I wouldn't have anywhere near the balls to walk right up to you. Look in your eyes. Synchronize our heartbeats at the same rapid pace and tell you, Christina, Marie, Marone, I have wanted you since I was a kid. Baby... I need your soul. 
Chris looks down and gives Marone a kiss on the cheek. I don't need yours. Marone lets Meltzer back in. Yep. <laughs> what a tangled web, huh? So you didn't know. Not at first. And she dropped her last name. And you kept on. Yep. You know, it's really funny how you were going on before about how setting an example for the kids and not acting out, and here you are. I'm single. I'm also not in the shark tank. You do look like a Mike in finance. Enter Schmidt, beaker in tow. Happy to report there were no casualties. He stops. Uh... What's going on, Chris? Hi, Steve. Uh, should I, uh... No. I I'm, I'm gonna go. Chris, stay here. I don't want to. Let her go. Thanks, Mike. I mean, Sean. She slowly exits. Uh, which one of you is gonna tell me what's going on here? Yeah, she's cheating on me with him. And he got the video of me at the bar from one of my students who sought revenge on me for failing him. How's your Monday going? Uh, can I just unplug this whole day and plug it back in again? Yeah, you really want to fuck me up, huh? Dude, you think I knew she was going to be here? And I know both of you. Stop. I don't know anything about this, and I don't care to. But what I do want to know at this moment, Sean, is why I'm not allowed in your meeting. I told you, I went back to check the district regulations for the superintendent's hearing, and they state that no other staff can be present other than the teacher in question and the administrator. I'm the department chair, Sean. That doesn't give me any rights to be there. I can vouch for his character. You could, couldn't you? <laughs> no, not like that, buddy boy. Mr. Meltzer. Sean, I need to be in this meeting. Now, unless you can show me the exact place in the district handbook where it says I cannot be there, I will be there alongside him. I don't have it on me. I'll wait. I don't have time to go back to my office. Then I'll see you at 2.30. You can destroy his marriage or his career but you can't destroy both. Are you gonna fight his battles for him? I'm not fighting a battle, Sean. I am telling you that as the science department chair, I intend to be at this meeting to vouch for the character of that guy right there. What is there for you to vouch? He's the lead singer of a punk band who never grew up and now is paying for it. I have video documentation of him. There's no gray area here. He definitely did a keg stand that night when he was sober enough to know better. And you're definitely seeing my wife. Or maybe you're not in the doghouse, but you knew damn well she was married to me when she told you who she was. And the fact that you didn't stop her or yourself. Yeah, Sean, I could vouch for your character. But I'm the one who filed the charge with the board. I beat you to it. They're not here to talk about me. And Steve, what kind of department chair do you want to be if you're defending a dude like him? I know you want to be fair, but I think your time is better spent fighting for teachers that deserve to be here. Yeah, that's what he's doing. So what are you gonna do, Steve? As an administrator, I think, I think you know what I want, right? At the end of the day, I just want what's best for our kids. And I like to think that you do too. If you wanna keep sticking up for him, you can follow him out. Our rules apply to everybody always. So what's it gonna be? Oh, also, this whole thing has really nothing to do with you. Sean, I just want everyone to feel comfortable and safe. I want everybody to be happy. So I'm not making you decide right away. But you do have a choice, and so do I. He starts out. Sean, you can't do that to him. Maybe you have the title and the rights in the cushy office chair, 
But that doesn't mean you can just rip anyone from their position, especially not someone like him. Someone who was always on my ass, trying to make me do better. You never wanted me to be comfortable. I mean, I'm just the kind of dude who needs fires lit under his ass, but when they're lit, homie, I go like a Maserati. You made me want something every time I walked into this room. You made me want to be a star. And now... Being a star, man, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Anything you can do to get these guys away from their phones and into your universe, you do it. That's exactly why my room is Dave and Buster's with a little bit of signs thrown in. All they want to do is play. They don't know that they're learning. But when they leave here, all excited, saying, I can't wait for tomorrow, that's why I'm here, man. That's why I wanted for myself since graduation night. I was walking down my cul-de-sac after my buddy's rager, bleeding and crying, because I got into a nasty fight with this other kid. And then I looked up. That immense, light, freckled canvas of the night sky. If you've ever looked up at night, you've probably realized how small we are in the grand scheme of things. I know I did. And how solitary we are without someone to guide us. But at that moment, after wiping my tears and blood and snot, I felt a truth that I didn't want anyone ever feeling as lonely as I did then. And that meant treading a path that would be hard and tiring and a gut punch to my soul. So be it. It was what I had to do. Even though it was just me on the street that night, I suddenly felt someone else was there. The, 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 the aura of someone my age who loved me, despite myself. And then more tears came. I was set. I knew what my life wanted from me. Not to teach, necessarily, but if I had a will to fight, I could be there for any kid. Make sure they'd never fall victim to a deprivation of their own brilliance because of people who weren't half as invested as everyone else. And you know what? I've cried so many more nights cried myself to sleep, wanting so badly to be that dude. You guys know him. I'm sure you've seen him in your dreams, like I have. He's not so much a man as he is a god. To be him, to inhabit his frame, would make you explode. Not just live, but explode. That's what keeps me coming back. What about you, Sean? Do you feel that way? Now, even if Schmidt can't be in our meeting, know this. My work, my kids, beat my heart. They are my muscles, my blood, everything that sweats and burns. They are miracles. Do you ever feel that way, Schmidt? You're a dad. When you see your students, do you see your two guys? I see my little boy just like he was in the ultrasound a week before we lost. And then again, I think disappearing with the placenta through the vacuum they hooked up to Chris, I never got to actually see him or hold him. But for the first time in my life, I realized how much you could love somebody, how infinite, how whole it made you. So if I couldn't love my own son in the flesh, I was gonna love my students like I loved him and become the man I never had the chance to raise him to be. I would do anything for them. What would you do, Sean, if someone came in here with an assault rifle in the middle of class? I hope you'd run toward him without thinking twice just so your students wouldn't lose a drop of blood. I would have done it for you, no question. I want all of my kids to grow up and douse the world in gasoline and set it on fire till the asteroid hits it. 
If that's not enough reason to keep a teacher here, I don't know what is. I'm not going anywhere. He crosses to Meltzer. You want to try to take me away? No way. He unbuttons his collar and pulls out a dog tag. I got my dad's Vietnam dog tag he gave me before he died. And more pride in my pinky than most people could ever get. I didn't get to stand here now by spending the last 15 years shielding my wrists from getting slapped. But, you know, maybe I do risk my ass every time I come into this room. It's worth it when I see Jeremy Luzos get his very first A on a test and then kill it on the AP exam. Or when Lauren D'Souza, who's struggling all year, finally understands the principles of friction. When they graduate and go to a Big Ten school, possibilities. So I think I'll spend my life fighting for that rather than myself, rather than worrying about what guys like you can, can ever do to me. And if you think Schmidt lived his career in fear. he become this big, beautiful, badass, compassionate mountain of a man that I've looked up to since the day I got here. But I love more than any, anyone else here. It taught me to love myself just as much. Maybe I set myself on the path. You are the dude who grabbed me by the shirt and dragged me to every setback and heartbreak and tear jerk I needed to face to become the teacher I needed to be. The teacher that I fucking am. And always will be. Cause Marone ain't going anywhere. I got so much nads and so much nation around me and it's growing. It's grown by the year. So whenever somebody has me, they get the spark. The spark of somebody kicking the hornet's nest and not getting stung, and thinking they can do the same. That's how you bring people up, add a little force, and that's how you make them extraordinary. And when you bring them all together in one moment, it's an empire. I'm passionate because I'm insane. I'm beautiful because I'm flawed. And I'm wise because I know these things and that there's so much more for me to learn. For all of us, to learn. I didn't have them around growing up. They need one. The bell rings. Look at me, John. I promise you, I will be here. Finally, Meltzer turns around and leaves. Schmidt looks at Marone long and hard, then follows Meltzer out. Marone is silent for a few moments. Then he sits down at his desk collapses and cries, just cries. After he cries it all out, he slowly walks over to the sink and washes his hands and face. Then he stops. What's that he hears? Faint chants from the outside. Save my road, save my road, save my road, save my road. It continues under. Okay, the fuck? He walks over to the window and watches. The chants continue. Liz rushes in. Scene. Go big and go home. Marone. What's going on? Almost the whole school's out there. Yeah, I see that, but why? They're cheering. Yeah, okay, who are they cheering for? You. Enter Muller. Oh my god, you're like Ed Sheeran right now, but older and with more cursing. Okay, what's, what's going on right now? D did you do this? Of course not. You think I have the balls to pull off something like this? Yeah, you're right. Enter Brittany, Dylan, and Creter. Yo, my road is a beast! Okay, what, what, what the hell is going on? Just look out the window. Maroon looks out. The cheers have grown louder. We, we are, are tool bags. Tool we bags. are tool bags. We, we are tool bags. Tool bags. It continues under. Brittany's cell rings. She answers. Hey. Yeah. I'll tell him. Do something in the window. Marone does a solid Rocky Balboa pose. The crowd explodes. Yeah, uh, this is unreal. Okay. 
She hangs up. He's coming up. So what do you think? Uh, nice quiet gathering with a few close friends? Okay. There have to be like a thousand kids out there. We got everyone we could. Yeah, but I don't even know most of them. And they don't know you. Well, not personally. But wait, there's more. Did, did you see the hallways? Okay. Okay, Billy Mays. Yeah, I, I heard about... He pokes his head out the door. Oh my god. He wasn't kidding. They're everywhere. He comes back in. I, I can't. We got all, all the apples we could. And a bunch of us raided the shop right during lunch, B. We put, we've been putting them all along the hallways for the past hour. You good? Yeah. Yeah, it's just... You guys are epic. I, I never would have thought that this would ever happen to me. Extraordinary men call for extraordinary circumstances. Who said that? I did. Just now. Wow. You an AP English or something? <laughs> nah, man. I just got feelings. Okay, so wait. Um, what I want to know is, who's the tool bag who started this? You mean other than you? Maroon smiles. I said he was coming up. And Billy enters wearing a big sign reading tool bag in chief. I gotta get back down soon. Gotta lead him in another cheer. Billy, you, you tool bag, you did this? <laughs> Fuck yeah, I did. Anything for post Maroon. Yo, let me get a pic. He pulls out his phone and takes a quick, quick selfie with Marone and the others in the background. Oh, okay, so, so how did you do this? Okay, so Dylan said you were talking about area and pressure today. So I figured, why not spread a whole lot of force across a large area? That way you don't have to feel the pressure of fighting this fight yourself. Well, you wanted to do something, right? And you said you liked loud things. Yo, stand in front of the window again. Get up there. Maroon jumps on the counter in front of the window. The crowd cheers. You win the school year. You win the school decade. Yo, are they throwing stuff? We distributed Fig Newtons and Apple. <laughs> and tool bags. I, I love it. But they weren't supposed to throw them around. Suddenly, apples and the little soft cookies are pummeled against the window and through the open window into the room. Marone crouches down like he's in a World War I trench. Motherfucker! He goes to the window and yells out. Stop throwing shit! He slams the window shut. You enter Meltzer at the most livid we've ever seen him. Mr. Marone! Yes, Sean. I didn't do this. It was these guys that organized everything. Like, I'm gonna believe that. You can believe what you want to believe, but that's the truth. All of these guys did this. Yeah, pretty much. Way to throw us under the bus. Look, I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. All of your hands are stained with apple juice and fig newton crumbs, and you know what? I could not be prouder of every single one of you. Especially the tool bag in chief. They pound it. Wait, who are you? <laughs> I'm Mr. Meltzer. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Oh, so like, do you work here? I do. Um, I've never seen you here. Also, your job sounds like Super Nintendo. <laughs> like the uh, Super Nintendo of Human Resources. Creator, I don't know where your mind is, homie. I'm hungry. But wherever it is, hopefully there's pizza. You have less than a minute to get everyone away from this building or I am calling the police. Okay, what's the, you're gonna call the cops on kids? Not them, you. I'm citing insubordination and disturbing the peace and the rest of you are getting written up. Yeah, I had nothing to do with this. If it wasn't for you, they wouldn't be out here right now. now you have like 45 seconds to clear them, Marone. Just open the window and tell them to leave and I'll let these guys off the hook too. No, they have a right to assemble. First Amendment, homie. Melter pulls out his phone. I will call them. Is that a threat? No, it's a guarantee. This is not what you want right now. 
I'm sorry, guys. He slowly moves to the window. Suddenly, Billy takes off his sign and throws it on the counter. Yeah, no, I'm not down with this. Why are you salty, bruh? What? We want him to stay. Don't take him away from us. I'm not taking him away from you. This is all him. Guys, just go home, all right? No. <laughs> no. You'd be making the biggest mistake of your career if you throw him out of the school. Marone is the best freaking teacher I ever had. I mean, before him, I hated science. I didn't get it at all. Then he came in and just, like, blew my mind with how fun it could be. And, like, if you don't understand something, he's always willing to stay with you. That one time I failed a quiz, he stayed with me after school and to go over everything I got wrong. And then I did better the next time. And, like, Dylan has the same story, but with a lab. And, and Mueller, well, no, he's a cyborg that never gets anything wrong. But we're not the only ones. And I honestly don't have any other teacher that would do the shit he does to make us awesome. That's great. And there are a lot of great teachers in this school, but they all know their place. You don't see them going to bars and doing keg stands. Dude, I do stupid shit like that literally all the time. Like about a month ago at Dylan's when I did the milk chug challenge and blew chunks all over his driveway and then passed out on his front porch. Yeah, I don't need to know about that. Okay, so I'm stupid sometimes, but that's real life. It's human. And I want a teacher that knows that. I want a teacher that sees that in all of us and brings it out and doesn't try to make us someone that we're not by hiding who we are because other people are trying to hide that in him. Marone, you said today that you're like an older brother. You're not. I know you've always wanted to be a dad, so you're like a dad to all of us. You're like... Mr. Roger on steroids. No, don't bring Mr. Rogers into this. Who's Mr. Rogers? Dude, you're, you're killing me. Guys, this isn't what you need. Aside from what he did, you need someone with principles and standards so they can establish them in you and make you successful. The standards I have, I have because of Marone. And my principles have guided me here. Now, to show you he's helped me become. He's given me the heart to fight for what I believe in and be whoever I want to be in this life. And if I can't do that, just end me for real. This world right now doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm confused, bro. I'm scared. But when I see him, all that noise goes quiet. I look at him and I see everything I want to be when I get older. Free, happy, brilliant, Fearless, happy. I want that. All of that. Is that it? Pretty much. No, it isn't. I'll turn to the door and Tyler walks in. That's a cool story, Billy, but you forgot one incredibly important thing. He reaches into his pocket and slowly pulls out an apple. He walks to Marone and offers it to him compassionate I hope if you can forgive me for what for sending it to him that was you fucking I'm gonna kill you he starts to charge Tyler hey. Billy restrains we got an administrator here yo it's fine I don't actually work here I guess I I was just angry and wanted to get back at him but there's so much more to life than grades and tests he wants to keep going with me so i want to keep going with him the crowd outside reaches a frenzied pitch save my own save my own save my own save my own sirens are heard outside billy runs to the window yo is that the cops the kids look outside, general murmur murmurs of affirmation and worry. Although Jim must have called them. I didn't do anything. All right, you guys need to get out of here now. Mr. Marone, 2.30, main office, you and me.
after our meeting, I'll escort you to the central office where we'll meet with the board. Yo, are we getting suspended? Just get out of here. He turns to go. M Mr. Melter, when I sent you that video, you said I did the right thing. I didn't. But you still can. Meltzer goes. T Tyler. Tyler turns to Marone and breaks down. Marone opens his arms and Tyler embraces embraces him. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so right. I'm, I'm so sorry. No, I, I made a mistake. Please don't let them fire you. It's, it's all right, dude. I can't make any promises at this point. But what you can do, what y'all can do, is be good and be strong. Don't let anyone stop you from being anything less than the best goddamn tool bags you can ever be. That's what it's all about, right? And to quote the great early 2000s philosopher Incubus, whatever tomorrow brings, I'll be there. Open arms, open eyes. Onward and upward, homies. Enter Schmidt. Yeah, I, I can't move my truck. Faculty parking lot on Jesus is blocked. Okay, see, so let, let's start here. Help an old dude get out of work for the day. What? Bye, Maroon. Bye, Maroon. Take care. Good luck, man. I'm here. Peace. Peace out, tool bags. The kids start to exit while Billy stays at the window and Tyler stays put, paralyzed. Are we going to your house? Sure. Can I come? No. Dude, of course. Okay, but I might be a little late. All this civil disobedience makes a guy crave Wendy's. That's what I always say. Spicy nugs for everyone. Dude, don't make me change my mind. After a few moments, he re-enters and turns to Tyler. Yo. Wanna come? Tyler turns to Marone, then back to Dylan. He then walks out with the other kids. Marone turns and sees Billy still at the window. Yo. General Tsao, your army's leaving without you. Looks like the mob's broken up. Well, the cops are going to want you to answer to them. You could be on TV tonight. Yeah, I should probably get down there before someone flips them off or something. Yeah. And it was a peaceful demonstration. We had every right. Well, not every right, but that right. Was it worth it? Hope so. He looks at him for a pause, then exits the room. Marone turns to Schmidt. Well, oh, I'm off to die. You're off to live. Billy runs back into the room up to Marone. God knows what's going to I love you. I mean that. If you don't love me back, that's fine. I just want you to know that. Turns to go, but Marone pulls him back. I know. And I do. Don't forget me, man. I'll stop breathing before I ever forget you. Legend. They embrace and Marone kisses Billy on the head. Brittany watches from the doorway. Brittany, don't be jelly. Billy sees the sign he left on the counter. He picks it up and offers it to Marone. No. Take it. Use it for the next one. There will Billy never take. be a new next one. Billy takes the sign and starts out, but turns to Schmidt. And sorry about your truck. Uh, I'll make sure. No, that's fine. Thanks. Billy goes with Brittany. Oh, well, I'm off to die. You're off to live. What do you think is better? No matter what happens tonight. What you doing around seven? Nothing. Oh, good, because we're hitting up Applebee's. <laughs> you know how they're having the display there of the crap from our school? I'll request that you and I sit under that. Why? We could just sit at the bar. No. First, we're going to get a couple of dozen fried wings, yeah. and we're going to eat them and get barbecue sauce all over our faces, because that's what real men do. I'm drinking a Natty Light, and you'll have a... Uh... PBR. Good choice. Grown men down in shitty college beer. Because next, we complement that 
with steak. Now, I mean, it's Applebee's, so it's not the best steak, but no. for a night out with you, yeah, it'll be fine. Then I got that Billy Joel cassette. Oh, shit. Uh, can we do The Night Is Still Young? <laughs> yeah, we can do it on repeat. Chris appears in the doorway. Good, because it is. Marone stops when he sees her. She approaches him. You might need my soul, but I still don't need yours. I need your being forever. Maybe it's mine to give, and yours to keep. Is that all you can give? Chris and Marone passionately kiss, after which... Did you eat that spaghetti and Brussels sprouts shit again today? Sure did. You suck. She notices Schmidt. Oh. Hey, Steve. How we doing? The night is still young. See you at home. She coyly smiles and goes. Marone and Schmidt look at each other for a second. You ain't getting that from me. Later. Schmidt follows her out. Marone is alone with us again. Scene, what? I don't have the words. When I was in high school, my junior year English teacher told the class at the end of the year, you know, bye, have a great summer. And then she said, you guys are going off into the world. And I'm still here. My life is just an ongoing cycle. I mean, she was hella sarcastic most of the time, but still, I don't understand how school could be anything but absolutely insane. Not for real. To teach is to assault yourself. Your joints ache, your heart pounds, and your head screams over it all. But your soul is just this nuclear missile, fucking gas tank explosion of joy, telling you who you are, who you're meant to be. And you know how full that makes me. Every laugh I hear and every smile I see tells me I'm home. And that I'm finally diving into something I need to understand to reach the plateau of the greatest me. But then there are days when I want to call it. I mean, I'm a superstar. I'm not superhuman. And yet there's something surreal about a student sitting in your room in front of you like an archangel. And then, like a second wind in the New York City Marathon, I breathe in, and I'm born again. And, holy shit, is it something out of a Spielberg movie? The universe tells me I'm here. It's mass at the Vatican. It's the Northern Lights. To be in a classroom in front of kids, I mean, for me at least, is feeling the love of God. I wish we were in a place right now where we could all feel that way. At least, instead of throwing policies and curriculums at us, they could work on a system that's more inclusive. And like, obviously I get that school isn't supposed to be a democracy, but that doesn't mean we're not all still imperfect. We're not, we're not struggling, but still nabbing wins along the way. And that especially doesn't mean we don't deserve a system that's cognizant of that, that celebrates that. I don't know, man. Someday, maybe. The phone rings and he answers. 122, we're on. Hey. Okay. Tell them I'll be right there. Thanks. Bye. He hangs up. He takes a breath, straightens up his clothes, then goes to get his coat and bag. Yeah, um, thanks for chilling with me today. Let's do it again sometime. I'll see you around, right? I better. It's crazy, right? People are dying around the world. They're angry and sad and screaming rioting in the streets. And here I am. He slowly begins to exit the room. 
Suddenly, Connor barges in excitedly and nervously. He stops short of breath at the sight of Maroon. Yo, yo. Oh, my God. I actually got to you before you left. Yeah, yeah excuse me. I, I, I gotta lock up. Tries I, to cut through. I'm Connor. And I just wanted to tell you that I think you're one of the most awesome guys I've ever heard of. Thanks. Now, excuse me. I, I gotta... Can I just ask you a question? I, I'm serious, dude. I, I have to... I'm sorry, just one quick question. Look, I'm leaving. Could It'll only take please? a second. I don't have time. Please, I just need to... All right. What is it? Okay, you, you better make it quick, homie. I'm gonna lock you in here in a second. How'd you get everybody to show up just now? And how can I be myself and still get everyone to show up? I know that was two questions, not one. You don't need everyone to show up, homie. Just one tool bag will do the trick. And then just be, you know? And if somebody swings their hand towards you, mean it and clench it till you both scream. That's power, dude. That's living. Got any music? Connor nods. All right, well, what you got? Um, a bunch of different things. Classic rock, some top 40, alternative. No, oh, okay, okay, but what alternative? Um, the Chili's, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Less Than Jake. Less Than Jake? They're really good. Yeah, let me see what you got. Connor hands him the phone, he browses. Okay, um, press play when I tell you to, and turn it up, all the way. You're gonna play me out. Follow me down the hallway. I got a, got a one tool bag posse. And like I said, one tool bag's all you need. He starts to walk out with Connor following. He turns to the audience. You too. Just be. He walks out of the room with Connor, then turns to lock the door. Because whenever you do that, wherever I am, my heart's going to sing riots. He smiles. Hit play. Connor hits play. The song begins, last one out of Liberty City, burn it to the ground. <laughs> Let's kick it. Peace out. He slams the door shut, blackout, end of play. Great job, Nick. Good job, everyone. Chemistry between Serpy and Dana. <laughs> uh, I'm still recording. Did Nick want to say a thing? Wait, I'm still recording. Did Nick want to say a thing? Thank you. Just oh, okay. thank you and beautiful job. And this was awesome. And All right. I'm going to stop recording so we can spread that love privately. Uh, we've been the Zoom players. Stay safe. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Read more theater. Uh, spread peace and love through the universe. Make a better place than you found it. Good night.